I'm going to show you exactly how my team and I assess professional and master coaches and how we tell the difference between someone who hasn't met the mark, hasn't given us enough evidence of competencies and skills to be awarded professional coaching certification and how someone demonstrates enough skill and competency to be awarded a master level coaching competency. My name is Colleen Joy. I'm the Global Managing Director of Inner Life Skills Master Coaching Certification. And it will be my pleasure to guide you through this detailed, deep dive, but helpful, simple enough to quickly grab some notes and take away some valuable information tutorial. We all know that coaching in its purest form is a calling, as if you've got natural skills and a natural ability to hold spaces for people, to connect to people. But what if you want certification? What happens if you want to take those natural skills and upgrade them into internationally benchmarked competencies without losing your unique spark, your unique voice as a coach. I'm going to show you exactly how you can keep your essence as a coach, but still support your own learning path to mastery. So whether you're going to be what we call a pure coach, which is someone that does not give any advice, or whether you're going to be blending coaching, which is non-advice giving, internationally coach federation, benchmarked competencies, with your expertise, with consulting, teaching, guiding, helping, that's up to you. Here are the four key indicators that we use to tell if somebody is coaching at professional levels or master levels. Use this as a guide, as a roadmap to challenge and inspire yourself to take your coaching to the next level. And if you are in the process of being certified and you have to go through some assessments, then this video is also going to help you to really wrap your mind around what assessors are usually looking for if they are using the ICF, International Coaching Federation's gold standards of competencies, which are measured at three levels, ACC, which stands for Associate Certified Coach, PCC, which stands for Professional Certified Coach, and MCC, which stands for Master Certified Coach. It took me many years to accumulate enough skills and competencies and evidence to be awarded MCC Master Certification with the ICF and I'm now going to share as much as I can in this short tutorial to help you to be on that journey. Whether you're planning to be ICF credentialed or not, I want you to think of the road from amateur coach to professional coach to master coach as a road and the road has markers and milestones but it's also a kind of sliding scale continuum. Now, there are four key areas or indicators that we look for, and we are sliding these indicators up and down when we're assessing a coach, and we're thinking, are they giving us enough evidence to prove that they've hit the professional level? Have they hit the master level yet? And the first criteria that we use, the first indicator, is whether the coaching is more surface or it has more depth. Now you get, of course, light surface and you get a sort of moderate surface, a little bit of depth, and you get coaching that has real depth to it. And I'm going to unpack now what tells us that it's surface or depth. Using the inner life skills metaphor of a well, imagine that coaching 
can be about getting people from where they are now to where they want to be, of course. But master coaching and inner life skills master coaching, the kind of coaching that I am deeply interested in, goes deeper than surface so that the journey is inwards, not just in the world. It's not just worldly accomplishment. It is also sending that bucket inwards to find the inner resources and wealth that we believe is sitting inside of each and every coachee. So when we listen to an assessment, we're listening to see whether at the end of the assessment, it's as if the coachee has a bucket full of recycled surface ideas. In other words, things they already knew when they came into the coaching session. Or does the coachee have a bucket full of aha moments, insights, new seeing, new being? That's an indicator that there's been more master coaching. Another indicator of surface coaching is that the coachee is left with a to-do list that is only practical and that the whole coaching session has really felt like created to-do list coaching. Not to say that there's anything wrong with coaching people to find action plans and create goals. That's still very valuable. But that is what we consider early professional, if not associate or amateur level. And that's not an indicator of master coaching. When the coaching has depth to it, the client takes away an experience that has addressed all of them, their creativity, their emotions, their personality, the depth of who they are. So they're always taking away more than a to-do list and their action steps, their, their next step that they want to take in their life includes more than practical checklists of activities. In fact, the ICF, International Coaching Federation, calls this awareness above solutions. So awareness above solutions is actually an indicator of master coaching. If we only listen to our coaches at a surface level, if we're only listening to the words that they're using in a very literal way, and we're not listening to their tone, to when they hesitate, to their confidence, to their enthusiasm, to their doubt. If we're not hearing deeper than the surface of the conversation, then it means we're still coaching at early professional levels and we're not heading into master coaching territory. So if you want to coach at master levels, set an intention and work on the skills and competencies and learn how to coach at depth, how to build wells for your coachee to break through those inner obstacles and to liberate their inner wealth. The second really simple and super important indicator is whether coaching is mechanical or intuitive. So what I mean by mechanical is that the coaching follows a rigid structure that you can almost tell that the coach is following a process and they're, they're letting the, the rigid structure of some kind of template or process manage the session. And although that might still give value to a client, there's no room to breathe. Whereas if we're coaching intuitively, we're listening to what's happening with our coachees. We're including our own intuition and the intuition of our coachees so that there's a fluid structure. We might use a process like using a recipe if we were a master chef. But in that moment, if we suddenly realize, gee, this, you know, this toast is cooking too quickly. <laughs> it says on the recipe, keep the toast in for three minutes, but I'm actually going to stop it because it's starting to burn. And we, we're, we're adapting. We are fluid, you see. So the more fluid we are with our structure, the more we can say, oh, we're hitting 
master levels. Now, there are still things that we want to hear that need to be included in coaching, like what we call contracting, which means that we want to hear that the coach has drawn out an objective for the session. We want to hear things like evidence, which is really details on that quote unquote contract. We want to hear certain goal excavation. We want to hear that there are some measures in place inside of the session, but these don't have to be delivered like a very rigid checklist. As coaches, we need to find several different ways to achieve these various important aspects of coaching. We need to learn the rules to break the rules. And when you listen to a master coaching session, you can't even hear the structure. Like a sculptor that has used an armature and then packed clay over the armature, you can't see the armature anymore. You can't see the structure. When we master the skill of really deep, meaningful coaching, we learn the structures to leave the structures and to be intuitive with them. A professional, early professional, and perhaps even just missing the professional mark is rigid, scripted questions. Whereas the more professional we become and the more we hit master levels of coaching, the more our questions are also fluid and intuitive, which means they're spontaneous, they're relevant. You can actually tell that they've been formed in that moment to meet where the coachee is. Instead of following a script and just asking the next question on the list. So what you want to do is you want to build your vocabulary of questions. But you also want to think about why we ask these questions. Practice the art of asking coaching questions to the point where you can very naturally, automatically invent and create spontaneous, intuitive, relevant questions in that moment. That's an indicator of master coaching. Early professional indicators around reflective listening tend to also be rigid. So rigid reflective listening sounds like those very typical reflective or active listening techniques where we say things like, sorry if I understand you correctly, and we summarize what we've heard. But the moment we hear very fluid, what we call backtracking, where the coach is actually really listening so well that they can weave the most important words that the coachee is using into the conversation, into the questions, in such a natural way that you wouldn't even notice. That's a mark of an intuitive master coach. There are three things that are usually lacking in amateur coaching and are only just barely evident in early professional coaching and then therefore are really super evident and are there in abundance in master coaching. And those three items are softening, space and silence. When you lack softening, space and silence, it makes a session more mechanical. Softening is softening has got more to do with how we ask questions so that we invite possibilities and potentials and that we have a tone of curiosity instead of a very forced, demanding tone. So when we ask a question like, what is the solution? That is a harshly toned question. If we invite the coachee with a more softened question like, I'd love to know what ideas just come to mind. Let's experiment and brainstorm some possible ideas. You've indicated to your coachee that they are free to relax. They're free to actually send that bucket down into the depths. And they're not going to just give you whatever surface answer is lying there. And neither are they going to say to you, well, I don't know. Out of fear 
that they, they are carving their answer in stone. So softening is really about creating the kind of space that's a master coaching space that allows our coaches to feel like they are free to make mistakes, to throw things out there, to change their minds and to really explore and discover. Master coaches also can use many different ways of softening. They don't rely on one or two that are overly used. Professional and amateur coaches don't know how to create space. They feel like they're pushing, uh, intimidating, making their coaches feel uncomfortable. They talk over their coaches. So what we mean by space is giving someone the space to look away from us, to look outwards into the distance or inwards in order to find that next clear seeing aha moment of, gee, I thought I didn't know, but now I do. Now, there's a difference between uninterested, disengaged silence and warm, engaged, present silence. A master coach holds a lot of silence. We ask short questions, succinct questions. We even take a pause to think about a question. We don't ask two or three questions in a row called stacking questions. We ask a question like sending that bucket down and then we be quiet. And in that silence, we give our coachee space so that they can take a moment to send that bucket down. Otherwise, that bucket's going to drag on the sand and you're going to have a bucket full of surface sand instead of life-changing water. The next indicator, early professional to amateur, the coaching feels like a straight road. Whereas as you head into the master coaching territory, coaching becomes like a river. An amateur to early level professional coach tends to start the coaching, get an objective, which is called a contract for a session or an agreement for the session. So now now they know what they want to do. They want to make a list. They want to find a solution. Perhaps they want to create some kind of emotional or mental state change for the coachee. And then the more amateur the coaching, the more there tends to be a straight line between, well, now let's do it and let's just check it off and get it done. And at the end of the time, we check if we've done it. There's nothing wrong with that. Once again, it's still extremely valuable, but it doesn't leave room for the river to bend. Think of master coaching as climbing in a little boat with your coachee. And now you're paddling down the river, or let's just say your coach is paddling. <laughs> or maybe you've got a paddle each, yes? And paddle, paddle, paddle. You don't know what's around the corner, right? Because that river bends. The conversation bends. It changes. As your coachy has new insights, oh, some kind of inner shift has happened through the conversation. You need to be able to accommodate that which you can't do if you're forcing it into a straight road. To help you to understand this, I want you to think of that river where you put the boat on the bank every now and then and step out for a picnic. In a coach's conversation, when something meaningful has showed up, you do want to put perhaps the opportunity for one, two or three little picnic stops along the way. Now, you're not telling your coachee that you're stopping for picnics. Okay, It's in your mind. You're thinking, wow, my coachee has just said something really meaningful, something meaningful to them or some significant solution has showed up or some aha moment has happened or some profound change or they've hit a, an obstacle. They've hit some kind of wobble. Either they've said it or you've heard it. There's a sense of hesitancy. They're giving you an answer, but you can hear they're not committed to the answer. All of those are indicators that it's time for a picnic. And what that means is that you don't force, well, we've still got more things to do. We must follow the road. You take 
the boat to the side. You explore what showed up, right? You, you unpack it. You spend some time there. And then when you're done, you get back on the boat and you head back on the river. Straight road amateur coaching also has this feeling of everything's predetermined. It does feel like a script. It feels like the coach knows at the beginning of the session what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. A master coach is comfortable in the unknown. They're comfortable being on that river with their coachee, not knowing what's going to happen next, not knowing what question's going to show up, not knowing what the coachee's going to say next. If you want to coach at master levels, relax. Don't try to tap dance. Just be on that river. Trust the process. Trust your coachee. Trust your coaching skills. And be comfortable in the unknown. If we coach at early professional or amateur levels, we also stick to what we know. We stick to the processes we know, the questions we know, and we hold on to them like a little bit like little children holding on to our security blanket, yes? Whereas a master coach is courageous, is willing to experiment in the actual session, to follow their own intuition, and they, they're on a journey of discovery with their coachee. So if you're coaching at master levels, you are really open to the journey, open to the adventure of that hour that can be life-changing for your coachee because you've been willing to meander down the river with them and you haven't forced the coaching into a straight line. And the last indicator is whether the session feels like it's coach-created or co-created. Master coaching is a partnership. It's a co-creation. It is not you feeling as the coach that you need to make all the decisions in the session. What do I do next with them? Is this exactly what the coach she wants? You don't need to make all the decisions. You invite the coachee to participate in their own process. You use, and I'm emphasizing the word invite, you use opportunities to say to your coachee, would you like to do the following? Or how would you like to be coached? How's that for radical? What question would be a good question to ask you next? So you co-create. If you're coaching at amateur and prof early professional levels, you have performance anxiety because you're the one doing all the work. How do I solve this coachee's problem? How do I help them today? But if you're co-creating, you're relying on something deeper and you're not doing the work, your coachee is. They're doing the push-ups, right? They're making the choices. They are part of their own journey. That's what a partnership is. And finally, when you finish your session, when your coachee has filled their bucket and achieved what they wanted to and much more because you've coached at master levels, if you suddenly slip into amateur or professional coaching, you want the credit. You want to be acknowledged. You have that sort of, did we do okay? Was that satisfactory? Did you get what you want? All closed questions. Clue, by the way. Whereas if you are co-creating, you open your questions and you help create a space for your coachee to acknowledge themselves with beautiful questions like, what did you give yourself today? Or what's your highlight from today's coaching? And that way your coachee will tell you what they got, which is going to feel good because you feel like you've participated in, in somebody's journey and in somebody's awakened ideas and you've helped them to build that well and to find that inner wealth but it's co-created so if you want to coach at master levels and get master level certification coach at depth be intuitive in your coaching make the coaching a meandering river with little picnic spots along the way and co-create 
in full partnership with your coaching.